Hey, Kalamazoo Community Church. This is Philip, and I, before we even jump in today to church online, just want to apologize for the back and forth. Uh, the truth is, is that before our um, inside is actually ready to be used, this could happen. And it's been actually, I think, 10 weeks that we have not had to move indoors. We haven't had to have church online. And today, the weather showed on most apps that it was clear from 10 to 11. And then, of course, uh, right when we get here, start practicing, it shows 1030, there's a shower. And then guess what? You're probably never going to guess what happened. Uh, we made the call to do church online, and then now it's showing that there might be clear skies. And then I'm just getting texts now that apparently it's going to rain again. So anyways, thank you for your patience. And sorry for some of you who came up to our building seeing nobody out there. Um, that's just the nature of this sometimes until we get our space completed. So... I apologize, but we are going to still have church. We're still going to preach and uh, hope that this message inspires you. But before we do that, uh, could I just give you a couple of uh, short little um, things to keep in the back of your mind, okay? If you are joining us for the very first time, what I would ask, what we ask here at a church is uh, welcome, first of all, but we ask that you try us three times. And you're probably thinking, well, I was going to come to your building today, so this is easy to try you three times because this is the first one. We ask you to try us three times before you make a decision on whether or not you have Here's what we need to do. If you want to get baptized, email us, office at mykcc.org. If we uh, don't have anybody email us, what we will probably do is postpone that to another. September the 1st. So we ask you to bring food and then you stick around after the church service and you get food. But on September 1st, we're doing it fall style. And next week when you're here at church, grab a little card at the hub or go onto our Facebook page or Instagram page and you'll see the items they need. They're going to do fall mode this time. So they need some fall stock type foods. They actually have that next week. Can I pray? And then let's jump in. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for technology. I thank you that we are able uh, to still meet, even though we may not be in person. We wanted to be in person. Um, we are still connected through not just online, but through your Holy Spirit. And we're thankful. I pray, God, that this message would honor you. I pray that it would encourage somebody today. In your name we pray. Amen. So have you ever uh, have you ever felt ill-equipped for a role that you took, for a job that you took? Like you thought you knew what you were doing, and then when you started, you realized you were in way over your head. Me too. How about this one? Have you ever lied on a resume before? Now, not really lie, right? You wouldn't do that, but you stretched the truth. You said, sure, I oversaw 40 people. They were all volunteers, but I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to write that I just oversaw 40 people. So let me tell you my story about this, okay? Uh, I'm a decent swimmer, like a decent swimmer. I'm not Olympic-style quality yet, but I'm a decent swimmer. I've been swimming since I was eight years old. And in between my freshman and sophomore years of college, I wanted to uh, make money because I realized college was expensive and I was a poor, broke college student and I needed to make some, some money. So what I did is I decided, and this is literally all the thinking I put into this, I knew I liked to be outside and I knew I liked the water. So I thought, why not be a lifeguard? That's obviously what you do when you think of big life decisions, right? Well, thankfully for me, the person who oversaw the lifeguards at our local YMCA went to the church I was going to. So I went up to Chris. I said, hey, Chris, I want to be a lifeguard. And Chris said, great, Philip. Do you have any experience? I went, yeah, tons. Lie number one. Okay. So she told me to come back the next day, which was Monday. And then I would be, I would go through the lifeguard test. So I showed up expecting the pass with flying colors. I really think she was on to me, though. I jump in the water and Chris says, okay, Philip, we're gonna tread water for three minutes. I said, what's tread water? 
I had no idea what that meant. She said, it's exactly what you're doing right now. I went, okay, all right. So I, we tried water and time went on. I thought there's for sure this has been three minutes. I said, Chris, uh, how long has it been? She said, 20 seconds. Like, so what she ended up doing is actually stopping that part of the test because she found out that I'm really competitive and I would rather drown than fail this test. So she let me cool off for a minute and as I was cooling off, uh, she threw this brick into the water of my fellow lifeguards. Well, not fellow lifeguards uh, are, are knowing what's coming next. So I dive in, I get the brick. She said, now hold it above your head and kick water. I thought, there's no way that's humanly possible. Long story short, I failed the lifeguard test, right? And she, in a as polite a, sh a way as she could, said, Philip, it might be wise of you to pursue other areas of summer employment. Have you ever been there? Maybe not failed a lifeguard test. If you did, maybe we can start a support group. But not necessarily there, but have you been not at all equipped for a job that you took or you didn't feel equipped for a job that you took? Welcome back to the last installment of our series we've been in for the last five weeks called Unsung Hero. This is week six. And what we did is we looked at the Old Testament, which is the older part of the Bible. And there's so many main characters in the older part of the Bible that there's a lot of unsung heroes that kind of go unsung. We don't talk about them too often. They're ones that you don't really think about when you think of big Bible stories. And we learned a lot from them, actually. And in this week six, this last installment, I think we can actually learn a lot. And I think we can leave today, or leave your couch or wherever you're watching today, feeling better equipped for the roles that you're taking. Okay, and, and, and here's what I know about you. You want to be prepared. Here's what else I know about you. You want the people leading you or that you're doing things with, you want them to be prepared. You want people to know what they're doing. And I understand you and I have likely started jobs that we have felt like we were really cut out for. And then we start them. And then what happens? We realize we need more than a GPA to actually work the job, don't we? In fact, this, this is what happened to me when I started ministry 10 years ago. I got into this thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to just blow this out of the water. It's going to be great. And then I realized I was in over my head and I needed more than just a GPA. And what happened is it led to something that I like to call analysis paralysis. And what that is, is when you know you've got this mountain to climb, you know you've got so much stuff to do, but it, you're paralyzed as far as knowing what step to take first, analysis paralysis. Where this became real for me was our known initiative, which many of you are a part of, many of you have given to. And I was able to, with our team, we, we cultivated this vision and we got on the same page and we were excited and I was able to, to talk to many of you about our known initiative. But if you were gonna have me also lay out all the contractors, all of the uh, volunteers, all the paint colors, and this and that and the other. I, I don't think, we would have went back in there in two weeks and it would have looked exactly the same as it did before we went outside. That is why I'm thankful for people like Kenny, our other co-lead pastor, who serves alongside of me and we serve alongside our elders and they were able to put this thing together. I'm so thankful for the team. But do you know what a lot of Jesus followers do? I'm gonna tell you, and if you were here, I sense that a lot of you would probably snicker at this, but a lot of Jesus followers do this. And when I tell you, you're going to think, yeah, I totally do that. And if you're not a Jesus follower, you're going to say, yeah, I've definitely seen people do that. And you have actually done that yourself. See, many people, when they become a Jesus follower and they realize how demanding it actually is to love other people the way that Jesus tells us to love them and to, to always honor other people above ourselves, when we realize how hard that actually is, do you know what we do? We fake it till we make it. We do, don't we? We'll attend a class or we'll attend a sermon series on marriage and we'll have our arm around our spouse and, and at smiling along and our spouse in the meantime is thinking, are you not even paying attention? Maybe that clip hits too close to home. Uh, another one that we probably often do is someone starts talking about money and we just nod along because we don't want anyone to know we don't really give or we haven't really made good financial choices. A lot of us fake it. Till we make it. Do you know what happens though when we fake it till we make it? And believe me, I've been there too. We do this all the time. What happens is it leads to a shallow faith. 
a faith that doesn't really grow, a faith that doesn't grow because we're we're shrouded by insecurity and we're shrouded by things that doesn't really give what we really are, give off what we really are. And if you're a Jesus follower, isn't that so frustrating? Because you want people to know that you follow Jesus. But sometimes we just fake it till we make it. In fact, have you ever been a part of an organization that faked it till they made it? I mean, many, 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 a lot of leadership is doing that, right? You're kind of building the plane in the air and, and things aren't really complete, but you got to move on because there's deadlines that this is especially prevalent in rapidly growing organizations. They do this all of the time. If you're a business owner today watching this, or if you're a boss, or in fact, if you're in any way feeling like you're not equipped to do what you feel you need to do in life, whether it be be a Christian, whether it be stay married, be married, be a parent, whatever it is, I think that today will give you hope. And I think that today will actually give you a way to get back on track. And today's message, I think, will just be very practical for you. That's why we take uh, all these measures to make sure that if weather doesn't cooperate, we're going to give you a message because one like today, it might not be very spiritual, but I'm going to tell you, it is so practical. And it's practical too, even if you're not a Jesus follower, the principles that you'll learn today, I think will really help you. They'll make you better at life. But if you are a Jesus follower, I've got to tell you this, if you are a Jesus follower, this will be even more helpful and encouraging to you because many of us, if you're like me, we're just trying to find out how we fit in and how we're supposed to do the things that we feel God calling us to do. And today we learn exactly how to do that. So Moses, Moses is one of the main characters of the Bible. He is like, he's not an unsung hero. He's like one of the heroes. And uh, Moses is given by God, he's given this, this idea, this mission, uh, to go and build a portable structure so that God could dwell among his people. It was called the tabernacle, and it was elaborate. And in, in the when God is listing all these details, it's pages and pages of just very intricate measurements and details playing to Moses, and Moses, I think, probably fell in over his head. I mean, this is a really big deal, building a altar, essentially, or a place of worship to uh, their God, our God, right? The same God that you and I worship. That's a lot. So what Moses needed was a plan. Plans are good. Plans help you go further faster. If we didn't have a plan, we would not have been able to fulfill the known initiative. If we didn't have a plan, we wouldn't know that we can come inside and still meet online. Plans are good. You have to have a plan. And what you have in this story is you have God actually leading the charge and giving them the plan. And there's a lesson, I think, for Jesus followers. Listening for God to lay out the plan. You know what you and I do? Man, we do this all the time. We often move before God even says to move. But when it's a plan that he lays out, things go way better. And when the unexpected happens, you know, you know that you've got him to pull you through. Plans are good. Plans are needed. But what do you need along with a good plan? This is good leadership help, right? You need the right people on the right seat on the bus, don't you? You need the right people doing the right things if you're actually going to make the plan succeed. Uh, some of you know this, some of you don't, but I was once hired by a church to be a campus pastor. It was a multi-site church, and we had locations all over, and I was hired to be a campus pastor, and I had never done this before. And I had no idea what I was doing. In fact, they knew that when they hired me, and they gave me no plan, okay? No handbook, no plan. I kept trying to ask for it. I had nothing. I was so frustrated at this that months went by. I started writing my own pastor handbook because we didn't have one, and I needed help. And thankfully, because I was really frustrated, thankfully there were other campus pastors that saw my struggle, and they they were just there. They took me under their wing. They started to show me the ropes. They started to show me what we do and how we do it. And uh, my boss that had hired me took a six-week vacation the, the week I started, the most important time for a new pastor to meet people and to get some momentum. And it was just gone. And, and I... I didn't know what on earth I was doing. I was so frustrated. And thankfully, these other campus pastors came alongside me and kind of pushed me along. And that taught me something. And I hope you hear this. It taught me that you don't really need the most talented people around you. Now, these guys were definitely talented, way more talented than I was. But it showed me what you really need are people who are willing 
to teach others. Willing People who are willing to be present. People who are willing to stand by you when you don't really know what you're doing and they're patient with you and they'll help bring you along. What you need is people who are willing to be taught. And that is exactly what Moses had in this story. You see, the text that we're actually looking at is very, very small, but the implications are so rich. Here's the text. Here's what Moses had. The Lord said to Moses, this is in Exodus 31, if you want to read it for yourself. The Lord said to Moses, see, I have chosen Bezalel, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, and with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. God actually gives Moses people to fulfill the mission, people to accomplish the plan. But that's not it. He doesn't just give them one person. He gives them another. That you go on, moreover, I have appointed a holy app. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything that I have commanded you. He basically tells Moses, you know, all that stuff that we just spent chapters and chapters looking at that you've got to build. I'm giving you the people and I've equipped them to do the work that they need to do. You know, the language here, it's interesting because it indicates that Bezalel, Holiab, all these other workers that we never even actually know their names, they were listening and attentive to do what God needed them to do. They were willing. They were so willing to be there and to do what God needed them to do so that they could be used. So what's the lesson for you and I? Well, God doesn't need your cleverness. He doesn't. Some of you are thinking, that's really good. He doesn't need our wittiness. I'm thankful for that one. You know, I, I once heard it said what God actually needs. Um, and, and it might sound kind of cheesy, but this is so true. And maybe you've heard this too. Maybe you can finish the sentence. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. I like to say it this way. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the faithful. Back to my campus pastor's story. I never really wanted to be a church planter. That wasn't in my plan, but that, that is exactly what I was when I came to be a campus pastor was to start a campus. And uh, I didn't want to do that. I didn't know how to do that, but I was really curious. I was ready for the challenge. I really believed in our mission as a, as a church. So I went in um, with, with just a microscopic team. I was given one staff member that was then taken and repositioned somewhere else a few months later. And as you can And, and what we did is we said, hey, we're here to serve you. And we know that, that you know, churches and schools, sometimes the relationship doesn't mix. So here's what we're going to do. We will serve with you. You don't ever have to mention our name. You don't ever have to mention our church's name. We just want to help you. So we could, bought them backpacks. We bought turkeys, actually, for them to give out hundreds of turkeys to give out all throughout the valley to families in need that Thanksgiving. And then um, we bought donuts and coffee for some of their staff meetings. And they never even really knew who we were. Uh, but for some reason, the relationship started to deepen in spite of all of that. And this was really cool. We then decided that we would just pray. And we were going to ask God to direct our steps. And we wanted to take advantage of social media. So we paid for every ad possible. It was like $30 here, $50 here. And eventually, we got the word out. You couldn't go anywhere around where we were where you didn't hear of our church's name. And what, what happened was amazing. We went from averaging about 12 people at our gatherings, talk about a momentum killer, to 10 months later at our Easter celebration, we had 300 people. Amazing. Amazing. You know, the Apostle Paul I think the Apostle Paul knows what you and I know all too well, that sometimes you feel like God's sending you one way, and he sends you a different way. If you're a Jesus follower, you know exactly what this is like, I think. Um, the Apostle Paul, he wanted to take the message of Jesus to a certain region, okay? And what happened is he kept meeting opposition, and eventually God actually sends him a complete other way, and kept putting these roadblocks that he ran into and had the detour. In fact, one of the detours, he shipwrecked. And what happens is 
even though he's there and didn't really want to be there um, at first, the whole island, because of his story, because of things that happened and he got to heal somebody, becomes followers of Jesus. I mean, have you, have you ever been there? Have you ever felt, like, be real, have you ever felt like you were doing all this stuff for God, like you were laser focused on what he wanted you to do, and then all of a sudden it, the plan just takes a dramatic turn? And you're like, what on earth? Like, what's what's going on here? Uh, how long did it take you for you to realize that that was actually maybe the biggest blessing uh, that God could have ever given you? You know, I think that sometimes we get too caught up on whether or not God's desire for us fits within our natural gifting or our talents or our personality. What if, what if all God desires is for us to just stay attached to the mission. Attached to the mission and leave the equipping part up to him. We all have likely been in a situation where we felt ill-equipped to do the job that we were supposed to do. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're the wrong person for the job, but I have to, be, I have to come clean about something. I was not a good campus pastor. I wasn't. I don't think it was necessarily their fault. I was not a good campus pastor. I... Um, I, I think I was overly confident and thought I could rely on my wittiness. Maybe they made a bad hire. I don't know. Um, but I think I was overly confident that I could fit into the mold that they needed for their campuses. I needed way more autonomy than that organization was willing to offer uh, for, to do what I felt like God needed me to do. So it's very clear a change needed to happen. And maybe you've been that way. I don't know. But like Moses, staying faithful to God in his timing is the other half of the battle. Oh, and let's not forget, by the way, when you read the story, the hard work mentality that Moses and these workers have. In fact, Bezalel, Aholiab, and all these other unnamed, unsung heroes, they had such tenacity and such hard work that they actually show up later in the story. They show up chapters later uh, as still working faithfully for God. So what do we need? Like, what's the lesson here? This is why I think you still tuning in even though we can't be in person today. Um, by the way, I don't think it's raining yet, so you can rail me later. Um, that'd be fun. Uh, but what's the plan? Like, what do we need? I think two things. Number one, I think a plan is a really good thing, especially when it's a plan given to us by God. But the second one, I think, is even more important. This is the big, this is the big point I want to make. Worry less about being equipped and more about staying attached to the mission, to the mission God's given you. I want to say that again. Worry less about being equipped and more about staying attached to the mission that God has given you. Well, what's your mission? If you're a Jesus follower, your mission is exactly the same as every other Jesus follower, but the arena or the environment in which you fulfill this mission differs. For me, it's pastoring made for you. It's working in a factory, working in a doctor's office, staying at home with your kids, working in a school. I don't know where it is. But here's your mission. Jesus said very clearly, therefore, go into all the world and make disciples. And he wanted us to teach people what he taught us, which all stems from his, I like to call it not the golden rule, but another pastor calls it the platinum rule. Uh, it's even better than do unto others as you would have done unto you. It's even better as the platinum rule. It's like, it goes like this, love one another as I have loved you. Something to do with sharing the good news of Jesus to those around you. I know there's probably people watching too that if you've watched this far, you're not a Christian. And maybe you're wondering, because you said, Philip, this would be a practical message. So if I don't choose to follow Jesus right now, how is this practical for me? Well, it's actually practical to you in two ways as well. One, a plan will help you go further faster. So my encouragement to you is to take the time to think about your plan before you take off. And the second is this, worry less about being equipped and more about staying humble and willing to learn, and it'll take you a lot further. And if you're not a Christian, if I may, I think that will help you what I just said, but if you really want true fulfillment, I'm going to tell you from experience, as someone who used to not walk with Jesus, it only comes through a relationship with Him, and I would encourage you maybe to reach out, either in the comments today, or come to church next week, or back in person, and I'd love to talk with you about that even more. Worry less about being equipped and more about staying attached to the mission God 
has given you. Often we need to listen to God and then we need to take courage to act. If, if I could encourage you to do something, this is the cool part about having to do online. I was actually going to have a special guest up on the platform with me today that I was going to interview, and many of you know this person. What I want to do is let you know that on Tuesday, I'm going to interview this person still as a continuation of this message. Many of you know him really, really well, actually. And I hope that you stick around because um, he's someone that also didn't think he'd be doing what he set out to do for a quarter of a century. And he did it and leaves behind an amazing legacy. So I'm excited to... I'm excited to interview him later on in the week, so be sure to stay up on our Facebook profile because we will do that. Uh, let me close by asking you this, okay? What's the worst thing that could happen if you ask God to show you his plan for your life and then took the leap to follow him? Remember, God doesn't need your cleverness. He doesn't need your talent. He just needs your attachment to the mission that he gives you. And if you're a Jesus follower, I hope that you stay attached to that. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for uh, the lesson that we can learn from these unsung heroes. I thank you for uh, people who have tuned in today and for everyone's understanding of our space being a construction zone, not being ready to come back in. So sometimes because of unpredictable weather, we have to make these calls. I also want to thank you, God, that it's been 10 weeks that we haven't had to make this call. Uh, we've been able to have a fantastic summer outside. So thank you for that. Uh, we look forward, God, to coming into this new space and continuing our mission, which is to know you and to make you known. And so we pray. Amen. We will see you next week.